Welcome to the Alphamind Podcast, hosted by Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall. A podcast which looks at the human, behavioural and psychological challenges of trading, investing and working in highly complex, uncertain and volatile environments. Our guest this week is Robert Van Aden. Robert has over three decades of experience in markets, mostly in South Africa, where he has been an analyst, trader, investor, lecturer and wealth manager in a long and varied career and is currently CEO of IG Markets South Africa. Robert has recently authored a new book called Badass Trader, which has been getting some fantastic reviews. The premise behind the book is that barriers to entry for traders are low and the potential exists, if you get it right, to have near unlimited earning power. But there's a catch and that is what seems easy is anything but. And that's usually down to the person doing the trading, the trader. That's why Robert calls trading the hardest way to make easy money. In Badass Trader, Robert talks about what gets in the way and shares some of the mindsets, mantras and principles you should try and adopt not to fall into the traps that the market sets for you. Whilst we are passionate about bringing you high-quality interviews with exceptional guests on the AlphaMind podcast, AlphaMind is also a business which partners and collaborates with trading firms to help them, their teams and their people unlock their full potential by providing outstanding personal and performance development services that supports them to cultivate peak trading performance. Our services encompass high-performance coaching programs and performance development workshop programs. Our coaching includes tailored executive coaching for leaders and managers high-powered trader performance coaching to enhance risk-taking effectiveness and dynamic high-performance team coaching. Furthermore, our powerful and unique high-performance workshop programs stimulate traders to explore how they can more effectively navigate the intricate complexity and uncertainty of financial markets. If you and your business are ready to explore how we can help elevate your people's and your business's performance, we invite you to visit us at alpha-mind.net or contact us at info info at alpha-mind.net. Before we go to the podcast, we would like to thank our podcast sponsoring partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. We are delighted to announce that listeners of the Alpha Mind podcast can claim a 100 British pound discount on their brilliant STA home study course. The home study course is an outstanding program put together by some of the world's leading experts in technical analysis and is based on their diploma program, which has been delivered at some of the world's leading academic institutions, including the world-renowned London School of Economics and King's College in London. To find out more about this offer, go to alpha-mind.net. Now, on with this week's podcast. Welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast, and we're delighted to have Robert Van Eyden with us, currently CEO of IG Markets South Africa, but with a 30-year career and the rest in markets, there's an awful lot we're going to be able to dig into with Robert, and I noticed that in his... Uh, Past his PhD was in the application of neural networks and forecasting of share prices, of all things. And of course, there's a lot we can dip into there too. But he's taught, presented, researched, published, and blogged about all things stock market and unapologetically describes himself as a truth teller for retail traders. And has a book coming out shortly, if not out already. Bad ass trader of all things. So, Robert, welcome to the podcast. You know, I know we know that you're an avid listener of, of us and the way we tend to drift around on these conversations, but it's always going to start with us. Well, tell us this more about yourself, but also tell us about the title of the new book. So, where did that come about? But start with yourself. Uh, Mark, Steve, thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure. And, uh, I would have never thought that as being a listener one day, I would be contributing to this wonderful podcast. So I appreciate that. Um, I started with the stock market at a very young age. I started trading um, as a student. And then um, I'll give, uh, well, you've mentioned that I've been in the market for about 30 years. So I'll give away a couple of things. So when I started trading, um, Technical analysis was the stepchild of of, uh, investing. Trading wasn't big as well. And um, 
everything was skewed towards fundamental research, uh, Benjamin Graham, all of that good stuff. And then at the age of 21, I discovered technical analysis. It still didn't have a good name, uh, but uh, when I turned about 21, they were starting to get packages available that you could chart and apply technical analysis. And I discovered a couple of books. I discovered my one of my favorite books, The Market Wizards by Jack, which you've had on the show. I think the challenge for me and the challenge for a lot of people is that you want to pick up the secret sauce and the secret recipe. And ironically, when reading through that book, um, I was actually very disappointed in the book initially because it didn't give me that secret formula or that secret signal. And then later on, when you reread the books, then you figure out it's all about risk management and mind management. Uh, but I was very, very disappointed. And um, I went down two routes with that book. I went um, Ed Sequoia and the Turtle Traders. Um, and anything I could get my hand on on the Turtle Traders that really excited me. And, and eventually they did publish their rules. And it was nothing more than you know, a couple of moving averages. But then a lot of emphasis on risk management. So that's how I kind of started. Um, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with technical analysis. I wanted to get complicated. In the early 90s, I started dabbling with neural networks, which is quite interesting because I get a lot of questions about chat GBT. What is the future? Is this the secret source? Well, back in the 90s, neural networks were the secret source. Neural networks were going to solve everything. Neural networks are, it's, it's, a, it's also part of the artificial intelligence, very similar to chat GBT. And the problem with neural networks, they did great until 2008, when we saw the great financial crisis, and then they fell out of favor for obvious reasons. And the big reason is, and it's applicable to ChatGPT, uh, our markets are not closed systems. So if you do apply any systems or methodologies, you can only apply it on historical information or limited future information um, in physics, it's quite easy to, to manage a closed system and you can do wonderful work, uh, but not, not, not in terms of neural networks. So that was my journey. And then I ended up managing stockbroking businesses for the last 12 years, which put me in a wonderful vantage point of seeing meeting clients and seeing what clients are doing, the mistakes they're doing, the success things they're doing. Um, I spent a lot of time mentoring clients. I, still, I spent a lot of time um, looking at client accounts. And then again, I discovered there is no secret source. There's just you know, uncommon principles or, or good principles that people do follow. Um, in terms of the book, uh, the book was an interesting, how I came to write the book. I was approached about a year and a half ago by a publishing company. Uh, I'll protect the name of the company for obvious reasons. Um, they liked what I was doing on LinkedIn. So for the last four years, I've been producing trading principles and they approached me and they mentioned, you know, would I, or, or they asked me, would I consider writing a book? I said, it hasn't crossed my mind. I'm quite happy with these principles. And they said, why don't you just submit um, uh, an application form and, I know Steve with your book as well, they, they probably wanted you to write 20 to 30 pages, submit the first chapter, your target market, who you're going to approach, et cetera, et cetera. So I did that. And then lo and behold, a week later, they respond and they said they, they don't like the idea of the book and they're not interested in publishing a book. And I thought, gosh, that makes for a good story, but disappointing for me. Um, and then I resubmitted. And the initial title of the book was The Unbeatable Trader which I was quite proud of. I thought the unbeatable trader was a, was a catchy phrase. And then last year, October, I was thinking about it quite a lot. Um, and I questioned, you know, would unbeatable resonate with a younger audience, Generation Z, Millennials? And I don't know where I came up with the title Badass Trader, but I submitted it to, to the publishers. And I said, to will this resonate with a younger audience? And they said it would, and they actually liked the name. So Unbeatable Trader became Badass Trader, as simple as that, Mark. 
Well, I mean, okay, that's a, that's a great story. And I, you know, I think that, uh, that this, this whole idea of um, and being bothered to make a point as well, that LinkedIn journey, you know, of, of putting out your principles and, and what it led to is all about, you know, sort of commitment, being bothered to do something, having a tenacity, wanting to be transparent, wanting to share. What, if anything, perhaps giving away perhaps things that other people could see were at least components for their evolving secret source of, you know, that recipe. Um, and of course it led to the book. And I think a lot of people just don't bother with that, right? I mean, there's so many people that, that hold things tightly, but you decided to kind of just let go of it. Uh, and did, did that feel like a, a purpose for you? Sort of a, you felt that was a sort of a purpose to want to do that? Um, Mark, it, it became a purpose because the vantage point of, of managing stockbroking firms and now I'm part of a leveraged um, international business, we got a lot of clients that were sold courses, signal generators, which actually cost them a lot of money and actually didn't work. And they work for a lot of reasons. They don't work because they don't take your personality in account. They don't, don't take your risk preferences in, a, in account. They don't take your capital in account. Um, there's an old saying about snake oil salesmen or persons. And there's a lot of that in our industry. And that actually became my motivation to, to try and get people you know, to focus on and one of the quotes I use, and it's a famous quote in our industry, that training is the hardest, hardest, easiest thing. The problem is there's a lot of easy um, methods out there that don't work because people don't understand how hard it is. And that became our mission. And also in terms of the LinkedIn principles, I do not focus on the magical indicator or the magical entry. I focus on the difficult things. I focus on managing your mind. I focus on, you know, risk management, one R, um, all of those things. So that's where the mission came from because I just saw so much misinformation out there um, being sold at a high premium. And then the problem is once people actually purchase these uh, products, you know, they get burnt and then they never come back again or they get burnt and they keep on buying um, and never succeed. So uh, we know the high failure rate of trading. And I think, you know, <laughs> if the likes of ourselves can all help and just, you know, get that number from 75 to 80 percent um, in terms of people that are successful, you know, that, that would help a lot. Just break, sorry, it's the other way around. Reduce the, reduce the number of failures from 75, let's say, to about 65 percent. Right. Th thanks a lot, Robert, for coming on. It's great to great to have you. And I've, you know, I, I love this idea of building principles because you you, you talk about markets as a closed system and an open system, and, and that's something which I, I don't think you know a lot of people don't get. A lot of people, and, and you said something else, think there is a code to the markets, and that there isn't a code. There isn't a formula. That's that's what happens in a closed system. There's a code. There's a formula. Um, it, once you learn it, you've cracked it. Yeah. And markets being an open system just don't conform to that. And I know that freaks a lot of people out. Um, it, it, it challenges a lot of people who are system builders. And um, I always remember when we had um, Master Parker on, about three years ago, that was after he was featured in Jack Schwager's Unknown Market Wizards. And when he was on, it was great hearing him talk about his system. It's always evolving, his system. So he's, he has a systematic approach to trading. Yeah. But it, 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 it doesn't keep working all the time. It runs its course. And then he has to adapt it and develop a new or an evolved or adjusted yeah. system. So it's almost like he's systematic. He's discretionary about the systems he uses and builds. Yeah, it's, it's a big thing as well, um, this, this open and closed system um, issue. Um, and, and that's why, you know, in terms of this, this, this whole move towards ChatGPT and ChatGPT can solve everything, 
the problem is, you know, you, you're applying a methodology to, to a closed system. And like anything, neural networks, I, I remember when, when I was studying neural networks, the buzzwords back then were fuzzy logic, genetic algorithms, um, all of those things, which have evolved, but not in the financial markets. You know, if, um, the biggest thing with neural networks is pattern recognition. And most of our phones in terms of pattern recognition on neural networks. But if you speak to anyone in the financial services about neural networks, they would laugh at you. And, you know, the problem is all of these hypes and we're going through another one at the moment, but we're dealing with a closed system because, you know, no system could have predicted the, the global financial crisis. No system could have predicted COVID. No system could have predicted uh, the events of the Ukraine. And based on that, you know, um, systems get it wrong. And, in, and to your point, Mark, if you don't evolve your system, you, uh, your system is based on, on a very open, on a very open um, methodology or open system. It just doesn't work anymore. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, I imagine your plan with, with, with some gust of, of the speed of it, just the how AI has suddenly this year become like the yeah. you know, so, you know, six months ago, it was, barely, it was barely on the agenda right now. <laughs> suddenly it's everywhere. Um, yeah. But I, I guess in a way that might stop us thinking to some extent that people look to do things, um, that, that they seek their creativity through AI and they may they may go for the, the, the trade construct or whatever. But actually there's... <laughs> This is a game where actually getting stuck in and learning by mistakes and 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 yourself being involved in the discussion is is mm -hmm. critically important. Um, yeah. And perhaps it is is time to perhaps talk about self because I know that you you also like ourselves pay very close attention to you know mental state and ideal trader state. Um, yeah. And in the sense of being and, and just what that means and perhaps perhaps you just want to break into a discussion about what that means for you and what, what you found important in, in that ability to pay attention to yourself as you evolved your own journey. Yeah, look, uh, I, I think, as I mentioned, when, when I started my own journey, it was all getting that secret uh, recipe and that winning rate that would make me get me in a position that I can retire. And that's why I was deeply disappointed in, in, in the market wizard books. Um, initially. I think in terms of, of mindset as well, there's been a lot of wonderful work, uh, you know, done in terms of mindset. Mark Douglas, I think I would probably say he might have not been the forefather, but he definitely set the stage in terms of thinking differently about trading. In terms of my own view of mindset, it's quite important. Um, I've always asked the question, you know, if you are a captain, an airline captain, you've got 10, 10 to 20,000 hours, why in the world would you go through a checklist every day? Because you've got the experience. The problem is we are human and we bring human factors into our lives. So for example, the captain couldn't sleep well um, and that results in not having the right mindset and slipping up. And it's the same thing with trading as well. We bring our humanness towards trading and we have to monitor that as well because there might be, um, I know you guys are very, you, you talk a lot about the physiology and, and, and the psychological state in terms of trading, but to overcome that, you need to be aware that you are human and that if you don't manage your mindset, and it's probably the big ones, you know, it's, it's fear, greed, and hope. You know, that's where it always starts with. That's, uh, I would say, the first ones. And then there are multiple derivatives. And gosh, I think there are about 200 biases at the moment. Um, but it's quite important because you can have the best system, the best entries. Uh, but if you can't manage it mentally, you know, because we, 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 get, we are human. We get super excited. We... Um, even the lexicon of our languages, you know, third time lucky, you know, uh, when it's hot, it can only get better. Uh, you know, things like that. When it's good, it can get better. When it's bad, it can only get worse. So even if you look at the English language in terms 
of the narratives, you know, it's, it, it, it just says, it, it, it goes into extreme points the whole time. And this gets, this flows over into trading as well. And that's why mindset is very, very important. And, and both of you also mentioned on previous podcast, successful trading is boring trading, unfortunately. You know, hearing you speak just then and say that, and sort of looking through your book and, and looking at some of the principles and, and what Mark said about, you know, sort of being is really setting yourself up to win. And I, I got a lot of that in the book from reading it or, you know, from, the, from as I say, I haven't read the whole book yet, but I've certainly had a good scan through it. And the sense I got was, you know, there's a lot of setting yourself up to win. There's a lot of setting yourself up to have a good philosophy towards risk. There's a lot of setting yourself up to develop principles and rules that are repeatable. And often, you know, what, what you said early on is, is people just want a formula. You know, they come into this thinking there's, there's a code out there. There's, I just need to learn how to crack the market, so to speak. In other words, they turn up with bringing whatever they've been doing in the rest of the world Okay, how they've been, whatever's made them successful in other activities, as if they can just apply who they are and how they are to their trading. And I'm sort of reading through these and thinking, well, you're making this clear to people that 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 is not how it is. Actually, there's a lot of principles. There's a lot of, you know, philosophical aspects you need to bring into your trading. Like you say, you know, less is more. More is not better. Rule following is a formidable task. More positions are not always better. Uh, ju just kind of, you know, lose often, but lose strategically. And, you know, there was a lovely one here. Focus on the bread and not the baking. Principle number two. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to hand it over to you because I think our audience would love to hear what you mean by that. And, I, you know, you explain here, but it's just a chance for you to, to talk about that. That's an interesting one. You know, I think we've all been exposed, you know, to, to people that have been given recipes, food recipes, and then it ends up disastrous, very simple. And then the question is why? It's usually because I want to put my own flair, or I don't follow the instructions, or I don't believe the instructions. So, so the bread and the baking example is basically there's a process. If you want to be consistent and you want to produce that loaf of bread of consistent um, quality, you need to follow it by the recipe and not deviate from the recipe. But the problem is we get bored because we are of creative nature and trading is definitely not a creative endeavor. And therefore we get bored because I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Why do people, why do people have difficulty following simple processes? It's because we are people, we are human and we like to put a creative flair. I myself, you know, I wouldn't view myself as very creative if, 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 it, if it comes from an from a artistic perspective, but we all have got ideas and instead of changing um, the recipe, we wanna modify the recipe instead of in improving the recipe, you know, it is just that we just won't follow the recipe. Um, there's a great Japanese saying, Kaizen, which is, in, you know, improving something. But we need to improve something that has worked. You can't improve something that you have just uh, decided, you know, I'm, if, if this is what the recipe is saying, or these are the risk management uh, parameters, I'm just going to violate that because, you know, it doesn't feel comfortable for me. So I think... In terms of you know all the years of speaking to clients and and analyzing their performance, it is basically people they do want the recipe. That's very interesting. You know that that's always a the thing. They do want some sort of recipe, but then they don't want to follow the recipe because the recipe is too simple. People don't like simple. They seem to be intrigued by complex. You know. Um, You've seen it, I've seen it as well. We have seen screens where there's such a lot of technical indicators that people actually get paralyzed because you know they need a um, uh, a conjuncture of of you know ten indicators to confirm to get in or out. So um, yeah, you know we we get taught from a very young age to keep it simple, stupid, 
but we ignore that to our own every time in a lot of things in life, not even trading. We, we want to add complexity. Uh, we just, yeah, it's, it's, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I really don't understand why people find it so difficult to, to, uh, to keep things simple. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in that, you know, keep it simple, uh, less is more. I, you know, I, I, I just want to maybe just get, maybe clarify something because I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to confuse the audience who are listening a little bit and maybe they're going, well, actually, I'm, I, creativity is part of trading. I, I think what you mean is in process here. I think sometimes you have to be creative, you have to be interpretive around how you look at the market, um, mm. how you analyze markets how you come up with ideas that you strategize but then we, we i think we're talking about then what you do with the risk once you've formulated those ideas yeah or or, or how you've you know if you've formulated maybe a, a, a particular trading approach the, de the difficulty is that people as they so often tell me i wasn't able to adhere towards the trading approach i developed mm. and if i had just done and i had just done it for many years it would have worked really well so yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Yeah, you spot on on that. Yeah, so you know, I think we're talking about the kind of mindset, behavior, um, yeah. you know, sort of philosophy to approach those sort of areas, and and that's where I think you've captured really well in this book. Like you say, you know, a lot of people come into this; they might everyone starts using some sort of system or method because they're coming in blind, yeah. usually, yeah. and they have to have a starting approach, whether it's a form of analysis, whether it's a basic system, it, it just kind of gets them into the markets and then they start to formulate something that suits them. But then this this is the stuff that you, you really need to be able to then sort of push that out and to make it successful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know, I, I think prior to trading, um, the sports arena started with quite a lot of this mindset you mentioned it in your own podcast about two weeks ago, Steve, uh, you know, the inner game of, of tennis in terms of how important. So I think what has happened in the last couple of years and with the start of Mark Douglas, trading has just caught up, for example, what sport has been doing for many years to indicate that you can have a skill, but you also need the mindset. And we, and we see it over and over, you know, when, when it becomes, you know, pressurized let's go back to the inner game of tennis when 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 there's huge pressure you know you're playing Wimbledon final you know a lot of the times the players are very evenly stacked up but the one with the right mindset I'm not always saying the strongest mindset but the right mindset usually you know the outcome is more positive for that person we will return to this podcast shortly the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, is a not-for-profit body, member-led, which works purely and exclusively for the benefit of its members and runs a brilliant home study course on technical analysis. The home study course is based on the diploma program, which they have been delivering for many years at the world-renowned London School of Economics. You can get a £100 discount on the cost of this course. Visit the Alpha Mind website, alpha-mind.net, for further details. Now, back to the podcast. I was uh, laughing about when you're talking about um, a whole bunch of screens and the technicals, and I just always remember back in, back, in, back in the trading room days of almost like the worst trader had the most screens, and there was almost this thing about, yeah, if you've got 10 screens, I want 12. <laughs> and that, but, but they were... They were creating their own distraction, so to speak, and that that loss of focus. I think there is this there is this sort of naivety about coming into this world that seems so complex that actually yeah. more is better. The more channels you tune into, mm -hmm. surely you're going to pick up the um, you know the opportunity from from having your fingers in so many pies. The reality is quite the opposite of uh, of choosing very carefully what channels yeah. you tune into what people you listen to, um, what people you surround yourself with, e even, mm -hmm. all becomes part of that. Um, and of course, beyond that, um, we, we talk about how, how you're sort of fueling yourself to get into this. Of course, and, I, and I've coached quite a few people that I consider to be Gen Zs or millennials relatively recently. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the one thing they're not, do, not doing, you know, no breakfast, 
barely any lunch, you know, feeling that pre presenteeism to screens is the way to go, you know, yeah. going straight from work to gym, burning out at the gym, having a snack for dinner, going to bed, can't sleep, wake up, do it again. No yeah. hydration, no rest, you know, no energy, basic principles of living, of, of turning up for life. And yet you could tell from their conversations about them in their workplace, you know, why can't I see ideas? Why am, why am I, you know, why am I losing money? You know, we've we'll, got, we'll, we'll focus on yourself first, you know, sort out yourself mm. and, and then you'll become, and I think one of our workshops, we had, we had a young lady at a coffee session come up to us and say, oh, so this isn't about making me a better trader. This is making me a better version of myself. And actually mm. from that, I, I'll have a better chance of becoming a better trader. Um, and that certainly is, is very, very true. Um, I want to ask you a question of, about this journey. And of course, we've talked about you know, the making the money and the setup, and that's fine. But at a certain point of time, you must have had your first experience of pain, of, of loss. of. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind just, if, if you would, dipping into just what that felt like perhaps how long it lasted for um because of course sometimes these things block us for a while and actually then how you learned to get over that going forward uh would you share that with us no absolutely it's it's an interesting thing I, i'm not sure if it should be a badge of honor but it seems that you know most successful traders have blown up their account at least twice or three times so I've done that as well. Um, and I, I've done it for different reasons. So, you know, the first time around, it was this whole focus on win rate and and not not keeping, you know, no risk management. It was like, you know, if it's hot, you put all your money on, on this and, you know, it goes up. And then on, on the first trade where I actually wiped out my first account was basically the emotional side, because you can't believe, you know, um, I was I was long of a position and it started turning, you know, and then all of these things come into your mind, you know, it, it's gone down for two days, it can't go down for a third day, it's a typical gamble, a fallacy, um, you know, two days in a row, third day, lucky, things like that. So. I was having these conversations with myself with this position, but not focusing on risk management. And eventually the broker actually closed me out because I didn't have any money left in the account. So that was end of game. And that's where the first journey started. So the first journey started where I moved away from this mystical win rate and I started focusing quite a lot on risk management. Um, but there again, a risk management is a bit of an onion. So I started, I only focused on the one, I'm peeling the onion, which is basically the 1% or the 2%, you know, how much you should risk. And that led me to my second uh, blowout. Um, because the thing is with risk management, you can view it as a pyramid. You know, there are a couple of things. So yes, you should not ever risk more than 2% per position. But then there are two other things that come into play. Um, there's a term called portfolio heat. Um, that's one. It's, um, it's very similar to what John Kelly did with, with, with his principle that you should not be, uh, the cost of a trade should not be more than 25% of your total capital. I ignored that in the second time. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, again, you know, we, we get the idea and it comes from the investing world that diversification is wonderful. So the more stocks you've got or the shares you've got on a portfolio, the safer you are. But there is a point that it tips. Um, there's a term called diversify. You know, there's a point and economists would call that the, the law of diminishing returns. There's a point that by adding more and more, um, you are not actually gonna extract greater return. Um, so the second time I blew up my account, I ignored this uh, portfolio hit or the Kelly principle. So the cost of the position was more than 25%. And then thirdly, um, it was in a bull market. I got super excited instead of having, you know, I don't recommend having more than five open positions if you're trading 
you know, CFD positions or anything, but, you know, uh, the market was hot and it was doing well. And I just started adding and adding more and more positions. The problem with adding more positions is more monitoring. Um, so, you know, um, I was effectively doing swing trading back then. So the more you have to monitor in the evenings. And the thing is, you know, and then there was a stage that, uh, you know, all of these positions were actually doing exceptionally well. And then the biggest monster that appears usually is greed. Well, they're doing well. I'm just going to open more and more positions because I had all of these wonderful dreams, you know, uh, retiring early and things like that. So to your question, I have blown up two accounts. First account was not focusing on risk management. The second account was focusing on risk management, but only one principle of risk management. Um, and since then, um, I spent a lot of time, I get my entry signal, but I spent a lot of time in terms of position sizing it correctly for the 2%. I make sure that it's never more than 25% of my capital. And thirdly, I make sure that I will not add more positions that I can mentally handle um, or that would put total um, risk to my um, capital. And interesting with that. Thanks. I've got a sort of slightly subsequent question to that was, how was Robert himself during that journey? What did, what did blow up feel like to Robert? Well, won't surprise you, it was terrible. And I, I think the second time it was even more terrible because, you know, um, we tell ourselves this will never, ever happen again. I will never, ever be in this position. And gosh, golly, it did happen again. So I was more, I was very disappointed with myself the second time. And um, I think uh, I probably went through all the seven stages of, of dealing with grief, uh, the loss, um, and eventually, you know, you need to come to a point and the point that I, you know, after being very hard on myself um, to figure out, you know, is this something I want to pursue trading or let me spend some time in unpacking where I went wrong and rectify that and make sure that I do not end up in this position again. But honestly, Mark, I felt terrible. Um, physiologically, psychologically, you know, it, it impacts you in ways you, you don't realize your self-esteem is gone. Um, you're not interested in a lot of things anymore. Um, you attach yourself worth even to this, this loss, which is not fair because, you know, it is one event. Uh, it's like trading. It's, it's one event over multiple events in a person's life. Yeah. Pain. Real pain, though, and I, I guess you yeah. had to manage yourself through that. Yeah, you couldn't just yeah. say, "Well, that's fine." I guess you had to yeah. you maybe take a break, or you had to sort of guess maybe stop reading self-help books and start reading novels. <laughs> as one of our guests said, "Just yeah. do something different." You know, but I think you need to. There are times when you kind of need to just move away, take a break, rethink, and then come 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 back with slight with a better clarity. Yeah with a better yeah. sort of re reset of your state, as it were. Interesting. I think, um, yeah, and I think there's some common denominators. It, it translates very differently for all of us, of course. You know, we can get angry. We can have busted relationships. Um, we can go to um, cheap ways of finding energy. We, we can binge on all sorts of things. And, uh, yeah, we start to not take care of ourselves at the very, very time. We really, really need to, need to start paying attention to ourselves. Uh, and yeah, th thankfully you stay the course and you get back to your purpose and then then it all goes swimmingly until the next time. <laughs> but at least you're better prepared for it the next time if you've got at least a sense. And yeah. I think that, that, that I think that the, the story for many people out there is that you know, failing is part of the journey and learning and educating yourself around that is part of the journey. Um, and if you've not failed yet, then, you know, kind of expect it because you, you need to know how to do that. You need how to get, get through it and find your way of, of moving on to guess, getting your energy ready for the next trade. Because otherwise, you know, people just, just go and hide. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you. It's, 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 it wasn't easy, um, but you have to work through it. And I think now as well, you know, back then, it was also a lot more challenging. You know, they're, they're a lot more, you know, like yourselves, they're a lot more, um, coaches out there that, that 
that you can work with and, and go through the process and that can unpack the process because sometimes it's quite important to get a, an outside party looking into your world uh, because sometimes you can't see, you know, you, you, you can't see the blue sky anymore. It's, um, and, and, and it's so important to, to, to have um, trading coaches out there because I, I think there's a misconception that a trading coach is there to provide you, you know, with the secret sauce and off you go and uh, you retire. That's not, it's to manage this whole journey of, of mind, method and, and mindset. Absolutely. And, and you know what, I've, I've, you know, I've really found what you said quite powerful a few minutes ago. I mean, the most recent comment is you can't see the blue sky, but, you know, you talked about feelings of shame, humiliation, and by the way, I, th I think doctors use that term, can't see the blue sky when people are suffering from depression. It, those feelings, that they're really powerful. They, they take over you. What thoughts were they generating for you at the time? Can you remember them? It impacts your self-worth quite a lot. Yeah. So, you know, you, um, you're a failure. You have failed. You know, what will people think? And I think the challenge as well, you know, a lot of people, we are involved in trading, but a lot of people that aren't involved with trading, there's a lot of skepticism. So now you've now they right, you wrong and they right. They you 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 should have never got in, involved in this trading game, because it's 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 uh, and um, it's akin to and you know there's been a lot of podcasts, it's, but it's just akin to gambling. It serves you right for gambling. Um, so there's a lot of that as well. Um, so support is quite limited because usually you don't have a lot of people that understand what you're going through. And, and then the only reference they've got is gambling. So you know what? It serves you right for, for doing this because you're quite foolish. And so you get that as well in terms of your steam is quite low. Um, people put the, the gambler label on you very, very quickly. Um, and then you start wondering about these things as well. Is it something that you should do or try again? Um, but again, you know, I think back then, you know, if, if there were people like yourselves out there that you could have these conversations with, non-judgmental conversations, because the problem is your inner circle of family and friends is probably very judgmental because they don't understand unless you... Um, you know, you know, other fellow traders that have gone through this. Yeah. What, what, what is your counter argument to them? If, if you made one or two, or if you can think back now and say, what, what is your counter argument to those? And obviously I think, you know, people, your family, they care about you. So they just think you're, you're, you're going down the wrong path. Um, but you know, there is a counter argument, isn't there? It, it's not gambling. It's a form of speculation. But it takes, you know, it takes a while to learn and quite a bit of experience. What would be your yeah. point? Um, I think the counter argument as well, you know, when I blew up the account as well, um, for any profession, it takes time. You know, you, you've mentioned it quite a few times in your podcast. We both could be spending our days on, on Microsoft Flight Simulator and we could be flying the Airbus 380. But I think no one would be comfortable to let us lose at Heathrow Airport and, and do an actual takeoff on a flight to, to Paris, for example. So it takes time. You know, to become a surgeon, you need to take 15 years. To be an airline captain, it takes you 10,000 to 20,000 hours, 10 to 15. So the problem is, you know, how I reposition this, you know, this is, I've made a mistake. It was early on. Um, I was very new. I, I was probably trading about three to four years, which is relatively new in trading, um, contrary to the opinion, because, you know, the, the, the people selling these courses and on YouTube, you can do it in one week and in three months, you're very successful. It's not that. It takes time. Everything in life takes time. You need to call to walk. You know, there are a lot of these analogies. So the one thing was to say, I need to build up a, more, a lot more experience. The second thing which I mentioned was basically there's a lot of evidence um, in terms of people that have succeeded, you know, um, if you look at the market wizard books, um, there are people that have succeeded, the turtle traders, for example. Yeah, maybe not all of them. Uh, and the reason why not all of them, we know is when they started violating their rules. But there's a lot of, there's a big body of evidence that of people who have succeeded. 
Um, and it's like any industry, you know, if you get into, we, we were talking about football before, um, you know, in terms of football, it's a very small percentage that succeed, but to succeed takes time, it takes skill, it takes mindset. So how I readdress that is to say, okay, I do not have enough experience. I need to retool myself, but I do know there are people that have achieved success. I don't personally know them, but I've read a lot about them. You know, the Tom Bassers, which you've interviewed, the Peter Brands you've interviewed. There are a lot of people that have achieved. And, you know, if you do follow them over the last couple of years, you know, they share a lot of the stuff as well. So it's not, and, and they've also had their agony points and their pains in the process. Uh, we all go through these issues. I think it's really important to understand that trading isn't something that you just suddenly get right. I, I know people are doing this into their fourth decade. And they tell me they're still making the same basic schoolboy errors that they did many years ago. But it's it's just, that they, you know, I'm thinking a bit like what you talk about here with a lot of your principles. They have a process, they have a set of principles that limit the damage when they do those and that capture the upside of what they're good at. And I think that's, that's where to go out there and think Paul Tudor Jones doesn't get things wrong, you know, or someone like that. They're, they're, they're just as fallible as anyone else at any time. But you know what? They, they, they have a process. They have a principle. They have methods. Yeah. They, 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 they formulate their own model of trading based around a lot of the, yeah. you know, the sort of stuff you talk. And I think Paul Judah Jones, his famous comment, losers, average losers. Yeah, that, 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 that portrait he's got in, the, in his office. It, it, it's a crazy job, you know, and I, th- I think there needs to be more books like your book. There's There's been a slew of them out recently that are very good. I think Tom Hugard's done a very good one as well. No, no, absolutely. I, I think we, you know, we, we, we're very spoiled for choice because the challenges, you know, it's, it's this need for more as well. And and you've mentioned, you know, people entering the market there. There are a lot of, there are a lot of podcasts out there, um, you know, but I would probably say about five of them. And, and you've mentioned a couple of the people as well, you know, who spent a lot of time and, and their purpose as well, you know, Steve, Louise, um, Steve Ward uh, as well, you know, Tom, the late um, Dr. Paul as well, you know, spending a lot of time in terms of trying to teach people that trading is achievable, that it needs to follow a certain recipe. And then uh, what I do in the book as well, I talk about uncommon truths about trading as well to debunk you know, the first one is that you're dealing with a random process and as a ra- and people are not geared to handle random outcomes very well. We like certainty. We like how things are going to turn out. But, you know, you can just see in the last couple of years from getting, for example, Brexit wrong, we got Trump wasn't supposed to succeed. If you go back in terms of, of the Ukraine war, it should have been a three day, according to, to, to the Russians, et cetera. We just don't get things right at the moment. So how can we expect to get the market right? Because it's, it's, it's random. So you need, you need another set of tools in your toolbox apart from this mystical win rate. It's, it's really interesting because people ask, ask me if, if I know now what I, you know, if I know now when I first started, would I be a much better trader? And, and I think there'd be some of that, yes. But that would still be the same errors because I'm human. And like you say, markets are uncertain and you bring those two together. And, you know, we're, we're still going to, we're still fallible to error. And it, it, it's kind of recognizing that rather than judging yourself for it. You know, you talked about not doing the self-judgment, those areas there, you know, letting go of that. And, and that's hard yeah. because we all, we all do it. Yeah. No, that's extremely hard. We, we, as you said, Steve, we all do it. Um, you know, because you know, if if you go to to behavioral finance or even psychology, there's an endowment effect, and you know, we we attach a value to something we own, even our own emotions and our own mindset. We just can't let it go because we 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 put in um, we put in time, we've put in money, um, and it just hasn't worked out. So. Carry on. Sorry, I'm just trying to remove a cat from my room. So oh, no. Oh, right. He's decided so, so, to start stepping all over my keyboard. Yeah. 
This podcast is going to go down in, in history, I can tell you that. So. Yeah, I know, that's cool. <laughs> no, I think, you know, what I would say in terms of the endowment effect is we, we attach a value and it, it could be, you know, a time value, it could be um, a money value. And then we, as human beings, when we attach a value to something, it's, it's very problematic to, to move on. Um, I've even seen it in organizations and, and I'm, see, I'm sure Steve, and Mark, where companies have invested a lot of money, um, it's not going the right way. But instead of cutting their losses, we have we just carry on and on and on. Um, and that's quite a distinguishing factor between you know successful companies as well. You know, um, I think the one thing that is quite interesting with companies and trading, if you look at Apple, so with Steve Jobs, he started it, then he left, and he came back. And one of the things that he was surprised with is how many products they were producing. He just cut all those products because they weren't making money. And, and that's very bold. It's the same thing with trading. It's, uh, you know, cut your, cut your positions, but also cut your, you know, um, if you do blow up account, which, which I have done twice now, you know, you need to reset yourself and you need to acknowledge it and say, you know, I am going to do better. Yeah, would, would you say that um, actually be, be willing to make more mistakes and, and be more relaxed about making more mistakes is, is sort of quite a superpower for trading? Mark, it's an interesting concept. Um, yeah, I, I do think, you know, um, it's an interesting one because the, the biggest challenge is, you know, the more mistakes you make, will it have an impact on your capital? Because, you know, if you go to um, Warren Buffett's rule, number one is to protect your capital and rule number two is to, you know, go back to rule number one. So I think if you go about it cautiously, um, yes, I would agree with you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a balancing act for me as well, because you are, you are potentially, you've got a, you don't have infinite capital. You've got finite capital, which you do need to manage. But I do agree with you um, that you do need to, you know, at, at times, you know, challenge yourself and, and make mistakes. I think the mistakes that I'll try and look at is, you know, in markets where I'm very uncomfortable with, um, I'm naturally um, from, 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 from an equity background. So, you know, I dabble now and then in the world of FX, which is very uncomfortable for me. And that's probably where I make the most mistakes. But I think it's also a bias because I just think, and I can tell myself, I can tell it, it's price action. If I'm, um, if I'm trading the pound or if I'm trading Apple shares, it's price action. But for some bizarre reason, trading FX for me, you know, my mind goes in a wobble. But that's, that's the kind of mistakes that I want to make, you know, because that challenges me. And some of the learnings I can bring from FX back into the world of, um, of equities. And the same thing when I dabbled with Bitcoin. I'm sure we all dabble with Bitcoin. That was a, not a big mistake, but there was a lot of learning, you know, in terms of how the market works and, and some of the stuff you bring back. Um, so I do think you need to be, make mistakes. But like I said, our problem is we... We've got finite capital, and that needs to be protected at all costs. Yeah, yeah there's a phrase that says uh, about mistakes, make them quickly and make them cheap. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, then, and then some degree of capital management comes from that. Um, Absolutely. Um, and sometimes you, you make mistakes that aren't yours. You you sort of inherit them as sort of an error. And of course, yeah. I think, and there was always a phrase that we used to have as, you know, the first cut is the cheapest. Yeah. You know, so don't, don't play. Don't play with the mental agitation of I've made a mistake. Just, just get yeah. out. So that, there's an there's an approach and a process around mistakes as well that's important yeah. to know because, as you say, you get carried away with with it and suddenly you've lost yeah. your capital. Right. Wise words, yeah. with Steve. Indeed. I just got to let you know that a, a message came through on my Twitter that someone's just brought your book on on Kindle. So as we oh, talk, wow. oh great! Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll come back to you in a minute, just to ask you again to um, talk about your book. But I, I had a question for you, which I wrote down this morning, 
again, it might seem like a strange question. Do you have a favorite worst piece of common trading advice? <laughs> worst piece of advice? I, I, I hear some really bad trading advice that's well meant and well intentioned that I probably would have given myself before I'd gone deep into this this journey. Um, oh gosh. Oh, so I, run, oh I wonder if you've got anything like that. Yeah, there's quite a lot of it. You know, it's, it's buy, buy low, sell high. I don't know what that means, um, for example, because at the end of the day, you don't know when where low is and you don't know where high is if you assume you're dealing with a random process. So that is probably the biggest one for me that always surprises me. And then the other one is, you know, uh, the train is your friend till it ends in a bend. Again, you, you can only realize when you're in a train looking backwards, you know, you'll never know forward. And then that's why it's important, you know, buy high, sell low. You don't know. You don't know if you're in a trend or not. You just have to risk manage it using stop losses or targets or things like that. So those would be, you know, those are probably the most common ones and they get quoted quite a lot. But for me, um, dealing with an open system, dealing with something random, uh, you, you're, putting, you're putting an absolute predictive outcome on it. You, you don't know. Yeah. So, so I, I love that because, you know, I used to have a, 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 a kind of a motto when I was a trader, which was buy high, sell higher, sell low, buy back lower. And that was a way, you know, that, that, that completely runs con contradictory to what you said yeah. is, is a terrible piece of advice. But I think that's the sort of advice you get from amateurs or people thinking what to do when they start. No, agree. Absolutely. I mean, that was the turtles. That was part of the turtles method. You know, buy yeah. high, sell hopefully a lot higher. Yeah. And then um, with um, they... I think Van Tarp came up with the one R they were using N very similar. So they would, they would end it up every time as, as, as they were going up in the trend. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's great. There, there, there is so much of that around. Um, and a actually that, you know, there might be people sitting there going, well, I buy low and sell high. Again, there are many different methods. Again, I'm not saying yeah. that that doesn't count for everyone. I, you know, I, I know people who, use methods and approaches that were completely contradictory to what I used to do yeah. and it worked for them. And again, I, I think that's part of it. You have to do what works for you. No, absolutely. I've also seen, you know, with my time with managing clients and advising and mentoring clients as well. And that's my vantage point. So, you know, and um, you know, I've seen the weirdest and wonderful methods of, of, of trading. And again, it's it's not for me to judge. You know, if 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 they generate a positive equity curve, who am I to judge? Um, you know, and this is the beauty of trading. And and coming back to the creativity question, there are multiple ways of getting your edge. And there are multiple creative ways of getting your edge. So, um, you know, that's that's where creativity comes in because we would all be very very bored if we did the classical. You know. Um, 820 moving average like the, the turtles did you know that that's probably your or, or the turtles or you know um, uh, Donchon uh, breakout channels which which uh, Tom Basso and, and Peter Brand do quite a lot you know but there are a lot of different methods and we've seen and I've seen the bizarre like for example following moon phases to whatever you know I've seen it all, but uh, that's the way the creativity comes in. <laughs> I, mean, I, I did have a client actually that um, his error account made more money than his trading account, and it was almost <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> he, and it was just you could see you could see every time he was about to trade, it, yeah, it was this ill thought about, and yeah, he tended to follow the trend. One of those guys, you know. Yeah. At the, at the moment, it was about to collapse, it'd go long. Yeah. Um, but it was very, very cumbersome. It was very almost like on another planet when he was trading. And then, so, oh, yeah. God, I, I shouldn't have done that. I need to just close that out. Those things were making more money than his trades. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's there's a whole, all sorts of models out there. <laughs> Absolutely. As no we know. I'm, I'm really mindful that we, we, we've got to get close to wrapping this up now. 
I, w- I want to just ask you maybe just to tell the audience again a little bit about the book, where they can buy it, um, where they can find more about you. Um, before they do, you know, I just want to say this is this is what every trader needs to re- read, this sort of stuff, you know. This is, you know, it's, it's easy to, like we say, learn technical analysis, learn how markets work, find a system or method. That is actually the easy stuff of trading. Okay. Yeah. This sort of stuff is the really hard stuff. And you, you use that, um, you know, the hardest way to make easy money. Um, you know, I, I wish I'd have had something like this back in the mid 1980s when I started. And it's, you know, it's the sort of thing that I would have kept coming back to and sort of referencing and, and self checking myself against as well. Um, so I, I think it's a great piece of work what you've done here. But now it's your chance to tell the audience a little bit about the book and where they can find out more about you and the book. Steve, thank you for the kind words. Um, so the book, um, I am based in South Africa. So the book at the moment is available in, in paperback in South Africa. And in Globe, it's available in Kindle. Um, the publishers are looking at um, putting it on, on paperback available on Amazon. And they've actually indicated to me as well, they will be testing the UK market and the USA um, in terms of paperback in the next month or two. So it'll probably pop up there. Um, in terms of where people can reach me, uh, I'm not very good at Twitter, as I mentioned. So uh, I changed my handle on Twitter to, to Badass Trader um, from my initial unbeatable trader. Uh, but I'm, I've got a big following on LinkedIn and I'm still very committed to, to my why on LinkedIn. So every Saturday I produce a, a trading principle. So there will be a new trading principle coming out tomorrow morning, principle 213, um, which, yeah, so they, they, they're coming through. I do get a question, Steve, where do I come up with all these principles? And I come up with these principles by listening to a lot of podcasts, reading other books, um, listening to non-related podcasts, because there's always wisdom. And then I try and extrapolate, the, you know, if, I, if I've picked up something from, from another podcast um, into, into the world of training, trading, correction, trading, um, and then um, that's how I come up with it. So the best call would be, in terms of the books for, for, for your audience would be Amazon and Kindle. And then in terms of reaching for me would be on LinkedIn. Okay, brilliant. And um, well, thank you for that. And I'm sure you're going to get quite a few new followers to your your weekly principles. Um, now I'm going, to, I'm going to hand over to one of the wisest guys I know in the financial markets, Mark Randall. Well, that's very, very kind of you. The best thing I think you've said about me ever. <laughs> I'll say, <laughs> Robert, I think uh, the audience's benefit, Robert is sitting there with a T-shirt that says Badass Trader. So um, uh, we're, we're certainly keen to get a couple of those, Robert, if, if there's ever a distribution of those. Excel, um, please. That's an interesting story, Mark. It was not my intention. So when I changed the name, I discovered there was a vendor on Amazon that actually sells these T-shirts. So uh, that was just very, very lucky. I didn't expect it. So I've actually got the T-shirt, I've got the hoodie, hoodie and, and the sweater. But it's, it's <laughs> got nothing to do with the author. <laughs> Living the dream, we're glad to see. But look, I don't want, there was part of that message that I thought was very interesting. So good, good trading is boring trading. And, 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 and keeping it, keep it simple, stupid is, yeah, is, is, is a message, message and mantra we should all remember. We can overthink things and we can want to know the things we have got no chance of knowing. And like I mentioned as a side comment that brokers have so many tickets of unables that were traders dreams, but they never want, they, they never pulled the trigger on them. So Robert, we're delighted to have had you on great rich conversation as we would have expected to have had. And um, we wish you well on your journey that continues, of course. And we wish you well with, with Bada, Bad Ass Trader. And, uh, or Bad Ass Trader. So bad you've got ass. the English pronunciation there. Bad Ass, yes, Bad <laughs> Ass. <laughs>
I, I get it confused as well at times between the, the US and the UK. So, uh, yeah. It's going right. to do well. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Alfmind podcast today. We do hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. If you want to know more about us and to find our past episodes and how to follow us so that you don't miss future ones, go to the alphamindpodcast.com. There's well over 100 episodes stretching back almost four years now. And we have some great guests in that time that will challenge you on these areas that we focus on. You can also subscribe on whichever podcast service you use. Also, if you want to sign up to our newsletter, go to Substack and then just do a search on the Alpha Mind newsletter. We do have periodical articles about these human aspects of trading performance. Um, finally, thank you to our podcast sponsoring partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. And if you are curious about them, you can go to their website, technicalanalysts.com. And if you are thinking about doing the home study course, which has been put together by some of the leading minds in the world of technical analysis, do consider going through the AlphaMind website where you will get a discount on this course. We do hope you join us again and thank you for listening. Goodbye.